Eastern Cape Provincial ANC distances itself from the Swellian Kiza slate punted by its Alfred Zoll region. ANC Secretary General Gwede Mantashe and ANC Gauteng Chair Paul Machadila's names appear on Mkiza slate. Two men accused of beating up a black man and forcing him into a coffin are granted 1,000 bail in the Middleburg Magistrates Court. Black Lawyers Association submits a memorandum of grievances to the presidency. The LA accuses the state of disregarding black and female legal practitioners in its briefing patterns and distribution of legal work. Now APSA takes on the public protector Busu Mkwebani. The bank wants Mkwebani's remedial action to pay back the $1.125 billion set aside. APSA also says Mkwebani has no jurisdiction to probe the matter that occurred well before the PP Act came into being. And President Jacob Zuma encourages South Africa to fight poverty in his Mandela Day message, calls on all sectors of society to continue working with government to fight poverty, inequality and unemployment. Eastern Cape Provincial ANC has distanced itself from the Zwilimkiza slate punted by the Alfred Mzor region. The new slate punts ANC Treasurer General Zwilimkiza as a third candidate in the race to replace President Jacob Zuma. The Alfred Mzor region is the Eastern Cape's biggest ANC bloc. Mkiza is touted as a compromise candidate in what has so far been considered a two-horse race between Nkosa Zanatamini Zuma and Cyril Ramaphosa. The provincial spokesperson speaking to ANN7 says that the slate with Mkiza's name may have been punted because branches are discussing names in full earnest ahead of the December conference. The third slate proposes William Kieser for president, Gwede Mantashe for chairman, Paul Mashadile for a top six position. I can first confirm that uh, the regional conference of Alfred Zo has proceeded so well and elected unopposed its own regional leadership this weekend, uh, starting from Thursday. But what I can confirm on behalf of the Provincial Executive Committee of the ANC is that we haven't yet started any nomination as branches of the Eastern Cape. Uh, to nominate and elect possible the national office bearers, including the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress. Yes, we do understand that uh, time now has started for lobbying and for positions and discussions within the branches, but we have since advised our branches that the prime uh, requirement that we need to foster as African National Congress is to build unity and collapse the slates and also develop a very comprehensive uh, leadership of the ANC that will be speaking uh, on the politics of the policy conference that we emerge from in Johannesburg. So as far as we are concerned, we are preparing for a provincial elective conference end of August and early September this year. So there is no starting of any nomination as far as we are concerned as a PEC, but the names are being planted, branches are starting to discuss. So it's difficult to know whether any name that is coming will sway any particular vote towards a particular candidate. Mm -hmm. But official as ANC in the province of the Eastern Cape, there is no nomination that we know of when it comes to national. Here's a list of presidential contenders and their backers. Ngosa Zanazamini Zuma, NKMVA, ANC Youth League, ANC Women's League, Northwest, Free State, Mpumalanga and parts of KZN. Sir Ramaphosa, these are some of his backers, Northern Cape, parts of Limpopo, Western Cape. Zuelim Kize has the Alfred and Zor region in the Eastern Cape, parts of KZN as well. Balegambete has parts of the Eastern Cape, a section of the ANC Women's League. Jeff Khadebe has the Midval, parts of the Eastern Cape as well. Lindy Wususulu has branch 11 of Amatole region, the Eastern Cape, and Lily's Leave branch in Gauteng. Well, uh, the condition of the ANC is very clear that um, all its members can elect and be elected. So therefore, there's nothing wrong with anybody suggesting any other comrades. So, um, um, uh, so we, we've got no issue with the suggestion of the Eastern Cape, but we remain with the proposal that we've made and still believe that that leadership that you've proposed must match. Well, look, they, that does not show this unity. People can, it's, people are still, these are candidates. People are preferring them. So once a Congress has taken a decision, that uh, the lobbying groups will be dissolved and a leader that would, that, that would have been elected will then take over the organization. So there's nothing wrong and that's not sure the unit. It's democracy at play. 
Joining us to discuss this conversation is ANC Youth League NEC member Lise Maris, as well as Tepo Khadima, political analyst, and Laki Tikesho, uh, Tekisho from the Transform SA, who is the deputy president. Gentlemen, good evening and welcome to ANN7. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Now, just to start with you, Lise we've heard the president going on to say that there's never been a more interesting time than now where he saw a lot of people wanting to lead the ANC. What was your thinking of that kind of statement. Is it perhaps wrong for people to be that ambitious and want to lead? No, I don't think it's wrong to be ambitious and want to lead. There's nothing wrong. The democracy of the ANC is very deep. Mm -hmm. It allows every member within constitutional transcripts to be able to contest for any position of the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. and so the there's, there's nothing wrong in wanting to contest. Mm -hmm. So as does this add the, dynamics perhaps when we hear of the Zuelim Kiza name at this point? Does it not divide members where now they're all looking to lobby for themselves and then there's greater divisions within the political party? No, in fact, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. It happened with Comrade Matthew Posa. Uh, Comrade Lindue Sisulu has been nominated, even though the process has not yet started. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say the internal democracy of the ANC is very deep. There's no gatekeeping. So as a member of the ANC, if you feel that the candidate can contest, it's within your right to go to your branch and nominate that particular individual. Mm -hmm. Lucky, what do you yes. make of this? Now that we, we have unpacked the number of people looking to contest, some of them have not openly said they're going to run, but here we have those that are aligned to these of, that have raised their names. What do you say when you see such a longer list? Yeah, our view is very clear. I think that the race is, is, very, is at a very advanced stage as we speak. Now, now, when, when Comrade Sueli Mkhize is coming on, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, topping up for the CR-17 because there's no way that uh, his stillborn uh, type of campaign will be able to take off. So, so our view is that there are only two people uh, that are punted to lead the, the organization, and obviously you would know that is the CR-17 and the NDS. NDZ. So, so basically, uh, we think that the reason why Zuelim Kize is coming on, on board now is really to ensure that whatever little uh, support that he has, towards the end of December, they will meet with CR-17 and be able to ensure that that little support goes to CR-17. But also the other reason is that they will be able to utilize Zuelim Kize to try and divide the support that is enjoyed by NDZ. And we, we, we think it's, <coughs> it, it might not work in our view as Transformer mm -hmm. Now, Tepo, for, for you, we're seeing or hearing a lot of names being thrown in this conversation right now, but very little of what exactly these people stand for. And this was something that uh, the Secretary General Guadalajara cautioned against, that perhaps it's not time to speak of names, but speak of the kind of leader that you want, to at least tell us what you believe this one stands for. Do you think we're hearing of what some of these members of the ANC stand for at this point? No, and I don't think that you'll really get to hear clearly what they stand for. But what we are seeing is that when it was realized that uh, the incumbent being President Zuma of course will not be seeking a third term, uh, it would appear that indeed the a new flock of hopefuls who when they looked into the mirror they thought that they saw the next president of the republic. Now the question is that can they really most of them amount to anything in terms of their campaign and I think some of them are going to be their campaign is going to be killed by a simple phrase and that is of radical economic transformation that those that are still uh, flip-flopping and uh, not so sure on whether there is a need for a radical economic transformation those that are not so sure if there is indeed or they deny that there is an existence of white monopoly capital uh, those are going to be clearly the losers I don't think that uh, they can be able to mount a campaign now, one of them, if you look, for example, uh, former Treasurer General of the ANC, Matthew Sposa, I think his campaign was killed uh, when he started his term as the Treasurer General of the ANC in 2008. That uh, one of the stalwarts of the ANC, the late uh, uh, Babu Henry Mahoti, I mean, he described him aptly, said, 
For the first time in the history of the African National Congress, we have a flamboyant Treasurer General. And that statement effectively described in total uh, this uh, candidate, uh, Matthews Posa, who we know, of course, that has always had an ambition to be president as early as uh, 2006, 2007. But what is Rather, wrong with ambition? It, what is wrong with ambition? Which is what there's I was nothing asking. wrong with ambition. That yes. can, can it be sustained? The answer is that no, it can't be sustained because it is not based on realism. But that's not the only one. If we look at uh, the man we are talking about today, the current Treasurer General of the ANC, uh, Dr. Zulim Kize, again, you know, from as early as 2012, he has been on the CR17 slate. So I can't see how. Ketile Ketile. There can't be no change now from moving away from that slate because his campaign is just really going to die. So effectively what are we going to see is that despite this new flock of hopefuls, there's clearly only two uh, contenders to the, to the throne and those contenders are going to come in on a slate. And they're going to come in on a slate. My own analysis is on a basic simple thing that the ANC is still premised on being the center of power and democratic centralism. That therefore means that your top six as well as your NEC has to be people that can be able to work together in a collegial manner. Because if they do not so, if the chemistry is not there, the ANC itself is going to suffer. Unless and until such time that perhaps maybe they moved away from democratic centralism, then you could say that, listen, it didn't matter who really we put in there because we would have defined power, authority, functions and duty in perhaps maybe one position that is of president. Right now, that is, did not even arise in, as far as uh, the policy discussions were concerned, except to say that they wanted to have a super presidency uh, in terms of the union building, but left Lituli House to still be based on being the democratic centralism. And that democratic centralism effectively means that you have to have people that you can be able to work with. Therefore, slaves are unavoidable. And if you look at it, it says, of the two slaves that are there, which one really has got a better chance? In politics, the law of being first is everything. Those that are coming after, they have no hope in hell of being able to, to, to make it. Most of them, they are going to be no different from a donkey trying to run in the Deb in July. It's just impossible. The two horses really are the Deputy President, Cyril Ramaphosa, and the former chairperson of the AU Commission, uh, Dr. Ngozi Sanatlamini Zuma. And the question is that who was first? And when you look at they've been running their campaign long before, I think it was even opened up. My own assessment is that when you look at where the power base is, Ramaphosa is endorsed by people who don't have a seat at the table, can't vote. And uh, Dr. Ngozana Damini Zuma is endorsed by those people that at the end of the day, their weight carries weight. They can vote. So that's where the battle is going to be. But it's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. The hopefuls, they've got entertainment value. They can't really do anything in terms of this race. Oh, my goodness. They've got entertainment value. Perhaps <laughs> to bring it back to you. You as the NC Youth League have endorsed Nkosa Zanatla Minisuma. So as he's saying, do you see her taking it and going all the way? Yes, I have to agree with uh, Comrade Tep. You see, once you move away from radical economic transformation, you are al already losing the plot. It's like saying there's no white monopoly act. Uh, we might have an understanding that the policy conference took the subject matter back to branches. But it's going to be an inevitable reality that delegates at the conference coming December are going to affirm that we have white monopoly capital and are going to take a stance that we must move for radical economic transformation. Mm -hmm. But then as for the lobbying, uh, Figile Mbalula spoke, about, spoke out about the clandestine nature of this lobbying, where people would call each other and have these secret meetings. At some point, perhaps there needs to be a change in the manner that you go about lobbying, where you do or you're allowed to raise your hand, like I said before, and say that I want to contest and this group is endorsing me. Do you think there needs to be some sort of change there beyond this? Because you were even at some point, as the ANC Youth League told, this is not the time. The Women's League were also told, this is not the time. Do you think that you need to perhaps start to discuss the succession issue and allow people to lobby openly? No, I think there's no contradiction there. Ourselves as the NEC, we met in a national extended executive committee meeting where regions all over the country were invited to make an assessment and to have consultation before taking a decision as a NEC. So we are saying that our lobbying practice is proper because we said that 
we decided structurally and it's a resolution. So as for Comrade Fikile Mbalula, we are still of the view that we are going to lobby for second Deputy Secretary General and we are still in support of Comrade Fikile. Mm -hmm. What he assumes or thinks of as a lobbying practice, uh, we won't contradict, but also he must also afford a space as a structure to do what we want to do in terms of our resolutions. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. do you foresee perhaps a, a breakaway, or if not breakaway, but chipping off of the ANC yet again beyond this elective conference after December, if perhaps maybe Sir Ramaphosa doesn't win? Do you see another chipping away of the ANC, or if Nkosa Zanadlamini Zuma, do you foresee such? Because they keep on saying we need to prioritize unity, but it yeah, seems I, this elective I, conference I, I think, is divisive. I think it's quite clear, especially uh, when you look also at, at the conference, or the Congress of the party now recently. And you look at those that have been invited basically by, by the South African Communist Party, are really those that are likable by uh, the uh, South African Communist Party uh, as opposed to those that are supporting Kosa uh, Zana uh, uh, Now, the, the, the problem here is if uh, the CR-17 is not going to win, the possibility, we must be able to say it without any doubt, is that they may be able to decide otherwise of not supporting because what they are doing now currently, you see, they are positioning themselves in such a way that in the event that they are not going to win, they may be able to break away. And like we've seen today, have the civil society organizations, all those trade unions and all of that, be able to be one block against those that have won. But I'm saying we, we, we believe in the fact that there are engagements that are taking place and hopefully they will be able to can resolve the issues that we must be able to respect the constitution of the ANC and the branches are the only people that have ultimately the powers to, to be able to elect their leader. If they have elected their leader, so we must live with that. Mm -hmm. Now, Tepo, you say that the CR17 campaign is supported by those that are not at the table. You've got the SACP, you've got Kasatu, you've got big business and civil society movements that feel somehow he would stand for some sort of inclusive growth and approach the country as more of a business than anything else, where he's more about the bottom line. Do you foresee there being problems if he doesn't take this one? Well, not quite, uh, but I think that uh, it, it is indeed plausible that we'll have a breakaway in the event that he loses, and everything that I'm seeing now tells me that he's going to lose. If he does well, he would get 40%. But I don't think that he'll live in Ghana 40% in terms of the, the electorate, and that's really based on what he isn't doing uh, more than what uh, the other people are doing, I mean, the other contenders, and in this case we're talking about Dr. Nkosa Nadamini Nizuma. And, and, and that it will mean that that breakaway will be hoping on the f basis that perhaps maybe the ANC will not get 51% or 50 plus 1% in 2019 elections and therefore they can be the power broker and they can still demand to come in. No different from how the SACP is, by the way. The SACP is overrepresented in terms of this government, uh, in terms of the cabinet and in terms of in portfolio committees in, uh, in, 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 in and yet they've never one day been on a ballot paper. So you'll find that perhaps the breakaway will be motivated or buoyed by that sense of thinking. Come 2019, we can be the power broker, can reduce the ANC power base below 50 plus 1 percent and therefore call them to the negotiating table for a coalition government. And that, will it uh, sus be sustainable? I'm not so sure. But I do know one thing. The leadership that gets elected in December to lead the African National Congress and lead them into the elections, there are a number of things that they need to now start uh, how they communicate and start mastering certain things. For example, know what you can do and know what your limitations are and know what is not your job. We've had many times uh, leaders talking from the podium saying that they want to tackle corruption. Now, we have to bear in mind that corruption, by the way, is a crime. And now, if the Constitution has not empowered you with any tools to be able to tackle crime, why are they not, or those that I think will carry the day, that leadership, will have to start communicating and applying pressure on the law enforcement agencies that they deal with crime without fear, favor, or prejudice. 
because that's the only way that you can be able to deal with it legally. Legally, every other um, you know mantra that oh we're going to tackle crime is nothing but hollow rhetoric. It doesn't carry the day, and you're just effectively uh, promising people something that you are not able to deliver on. So it's a question of that: Will the leadership that comes in be able to then, in leading to the elections, start to really apply pressure where it needs to be? And at the same time, understanding that they have the capacity in terms of lawmaking to also start now pu pushing for laws that can eventuate into radical economic transformation so that you can uh, very decisively tackle the three evils of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And if they do that, then they have a good chance of being able to win once again by a landslide come 2019. We have to bear in mind that 1994 ANC with Mandela's brand only garnered 62 percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. I'm of the view that probably the ANC still got a very good chance of garnering if they maintain and they start to implement radical economic transformation and be at idem that white monopoly capital is the enemy. We live in a country, I think Pinky Kwabani yesterday of Uncensored Opinion published that they were by three men effectively control food, energy, banking, and effectively they control our lives and they control the masses. Now, if you don't tackle that, because the adverse effect is, it is a direct contribution to these high levels of unemployment, high levels of poverty, high levels of inequality, that concentration. And I encourage the viewers to go and read that uh, uh, article by Binky Kwabani in Uncensored Opinion, because it clearly, if anything, articulated the source of our economic woes or our socioeconomic woes. And therefore, the leadership that is able to articulate and be seized with this reality and formulate decisive measures to deal with it, that is the leadership that I believe will be voted in or will be victorious. They will be voted in in December and they will lead ANC into decisive victory come 2019. But if they fail to do that, if they are still undecided and flip-flopping on whether there is need for radical economic transformation, whether white monopoly capital is the enemy, then we will see an ANC that drops below 50%. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of that phrase, white monopoly capital, yesterday Tabon Begi said, white monopoly capital, what is that? And that was to a round of applause. What is your view on just that, where we have a former statesman, this is a former president of the ANC as well, who goes on to hold this view? Because we still would expect that ANC member come from the same school of thought. But here we had the former statesman saying, what is white monopoly capital? It is unfortunate and embarrassing that uh, we could have a former leader uttering such uh, comments. If that leader had read uh, this article I'm referring to, published by Pinky Khawani, would of course never have said that in the evening, that it appeared on the same day, clearly uh, showing where, what is the key source of our, our challenges. And by the way, the same leader, former President Thabo Mbeki, is uh, recorded that there are certain comments accorded to him in 1989 where he very specifically spoke about that the need to tackle white monopoly capital that is pervasive in all areas of the economy and that, that was the chief enemy. Now, I think at the same opportunity that he had where I believe that he spoke for two hours, he would have done well by coming out with the numbers to say, listen, this is an... Today we sit here, the JSE, 97% of the JSE is in white hands. How can anybody really be expected to be believed by saying there is no white monopoly capital when 97 percent of the JSE and the stock market by the way that is where the wealth of a nation is created that is a platform where the wealth of a nation is created because that is where capital is raised to be invested in the economy and we have seen that that 97 percent economic concentration they've not been investing in this economy and if anything they have been extracting as much value as they can. So I, I just, I find it flabbergasting that uh, he never supported his argument with facts. Mm -hmm. Just to support, I think a very simple example is that we experience it on a daily basis. I'm saying daily, every day when you go to work, something is happening that relates, or that will be able to then uh, remind you of white monopoly capital. I'm saying he has mixed a lot of examples around what white monopoly capital is doing to our lives, to our people and all of that. But I, I, I think it's a misnomer. I think we must begin to move away from that. 
and be able to focus really on what we do to be able to better the lives of our people. We know it's there. We can't argue co uh, continuously about whether it's there or not, but we know there's white monopoly capital. What do we do to be able to ensure that uh, we change the lives of people, we contest it, such that we must be able to then also empower our black people. I'm saying we can't continuously discuss this thing that is there. Hmm. No, you I know? hear you. It's there. Hmm. I hear you. Clearly, white monopoly capital remains a very contentious yes. issue. But uh, as you've said, as the panel, that the one that will stand the test of time is the one that will speak of radical economic transformation yes. and the white monopoly capital. Well, we take a short break and check in with our weather desk.